we're live. So just a quick intro to everyone. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, I'm excited to see this uh, this presentation from Melly, who recently did the Linking Your Thinking course. Um, and I've seen Melly's, Melly's craft a few times now, and it always inspires me. It's beautiful. It's well laid out. Uh, and I'm really excited to see what she's going to share with us today. So over to you, Melly, and yeah, let us know if you've got any questions in the chat or at the end, we'll have some time to come on screen and ask questions too. So over to you. Sounds good. Uh, so I'm Melly. I am a software engineer by trade, um, but I also do, I'm in grad school right now for uh, my computer science master's, but looking at uh, using tools in computer science to help ecology and animals in general. Um, but in my free time, um, so I use craft for both work and for school, and then um, I like to use it as my second brain. So for me, um, I've got a lot of things going on. I love learning, and I love to keep everything together, and then the ability to have things easily linked in a beautiful UI really encourages me to write more and connect more and start uh, figuring out where all the different subjects actually do have a lot of intersections. Um, so when I started with craft, um, gosh, I was like right towards the beginning, I found craft. Um, and I loved the UI right away. Um, so I've been building my system for, so that'd be like over a year now. And I got pretty far on my own, but especially with a lot of YouTube videos. But I ended up feeling like there was like a little piece missing that I just couldn't figure out why certain areas um, weren't flowing the way I wanted to, or I kept hitting obstacles. Um, so I decided to go and take this uh, workshop by Nick Milo called Linking Your Thinking. So as an introduction for him, um, Linking Your Thinking is, uh, so backing up. Nick Milo is just a wonderful human being who during the pandemic started out a YouTube channel for linking your thinking. So he uses Obsidian to do his second brain, which he does primarily for literature, for films. Um, he works as an editor in Hollywood and he's um, been on Breaking Bad and a bunch of other things. Uh, and just a really cool guy in general, honestly. He's pretty fun. Um, but he noticed that a lot of he wanted to share all the struggles he had and the obstacles he was doing as he progressed on his obsidian um, journey. And really he wanted to get out of the world of note taking. So he, I remember he said he, he fell into the collector fallacy often in his journey of bringing in all the information into Evernote, clipping it everywhere and then never looking at it again. And so when he started a new in obsidian, he really wanted to find a way to break that cycle and be able to actually remember and use the information. So um, I don't know if he coined the term or if someone else around the same time did, but it kind of caught on of the idea of note making instead of note taking. And really this really revolves around the idea that instead of trying to just ingest notes and just absorb it, to really bring out your own thoughts and making sure that it's your own words and your own thought process and that you just use it as supporting evidence. Now this really drew me in as a researcher because that's what you're doing all the time. You're never just bringing in someone else's and piecing it together. You have to bring up your own novel idea. And um, so this kind of really fit into the ideas there. Now, after several years on YouTube, his community really grew and there were so many questions. He started out with um, just some like online curriculums and stuff and then eventually brought in the workshop. And so I had seen the workshop for a long time, but I was getting along on my own. So I didn't join until workshop eight, which is actually, I think, really good because it means it's had eight rounds of trying out different things and learning. And so um, I will share, start sharing my screen now. And also, like Tom said, if there's any questions, feel free to raise your hand, shout it out, put it in the chat. And we're good to go. If I can find the share button. There we go. Um, I shared the whole thing, didn't it? No. Be organized for just a moment so I can still see all your lovely faces.
All right, so if you could let me know if there's any questions in the chat at any point when you're in shared screen, it looks like it takes out the chat. Sure thing, Brody. Thank you. All right, so um, I will be posting this note up on the, the post for anyone um, later on. Uh, it has links to the linking your thinking uh, to the URL, um, as well as to um, Nick Milo and his accounts, if you would like to follow along or anything like that. So the workshops, um, how they're structured is it's really more of a community. It's um, so I think ours, I think ours had around 100 people in it. And then to help bridge the community when there's so many people, you get divvied up into different um, I don't remember what they call them, but like little groups where you have a facilitator and then your group is no more than 10, but it's usually, I think ours was like eight um, people that you can interact with on a forum, um, have Zoom calls and things like that. And then um, you have Nick Milo teaches two sessions every week. One is like um, more of a webinar-ish, but lots of interaction and a lot of live examples. And then the second is uh, one of my favorites. He calls it a sense-making session. And it's really just using the, the framework to um, take a topic that someone in the audience thinks about and just dive in. And it's really fun to watch. He's got an example up on his YouTube of him doing it with a jazz. Um, it's very fun, highly recommend. Um, and then you have four other lecturers which is so cool. Um, they change on every workshop, which is depending on who's available, but um, they are from all different disciplines. Like on ours, we had two writers, um, a lawyer and a researcher, I think. And um, it's a great way. So you see not only his thought process, but other people's right off the bat and different ways of using it in your daily life and different things like that. Um, and then, you also have access to uh, videos for the curriculum as well as um, written out, which I think is really great because it means that pretty much any learning style, if you can't be there for the live videos, they're all recorded. But if you don't wanna be a part of any of the live at all, there's just the curriculum. You can learn in any way that works for you and you will always have access to it, which is great. So you can take your time. And um, but yeah, so I decided after, so long doing it on my own that I was kind of bored of doing it on my own and I wanted to go meet other people in the peak game world and go nerd out for a little while so I decided to invest in it and I'm so glad I did so some of my um I guess before I jump into some of my takeaways does anybody have any questions yeah nothing great. in chat this day Joe sounds good um so for some of my top takeaways one of my favorites was the emphasis on making it your own. And um, right off the bat, you take this really big survey and at the end of it, you learn if you're more of a top-down thinker or a bottom-up thinker, how you like, what some of your goals and visions are. Um, and of course it's, you know, it's just a quiz and it's, it's nothing, I don't think it was, built by psychologists or anything like that so I'm not like it's more for fun um but it is really fun to learn a little bit more about yourself because sometimes you do need someone to ask a bunch of those questions and then see it um I got to learn that I am um very much a top-down thinker most people were like somewhat of a bottom-up and somewhat of a top-down there was like a mixture mine was like a hundred percent top-down so that works it's good to know um I'm just curious, sorry to stop you there, Melly. Uh, could you describe what that means to anyone who doesn't know, like top down thinkers and bottom up thinkers? Absolutely. And I'm sorry if you hear my cat in the background. He is a Siamese <laughs> and he is very talkative. That's okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so for from what I understand, so a uh, bottom up thinker is someone who likes to take all the tiny pieces and then build them together after that. So you don't start with the abstract you start with concrete and um build it all together versus for me i'm top down i like to start with those abstract co uh concepts and then eventually get to the weeds if i really must um and i knew that about myself beforehand so it did match what i already knew but i was surprised that there was like no bottom up I'm like, okay 
What that means in a practical sense is probably what I was running into with my PKM. I didn't follow Zettelkasten exactly. And for those of you who don't know, Zettelkasten is all around making atomic um, notes where it's really, um, your note is really just the title um, and then links to other notes that are relevant. Um, so it's really, really subdivided into just one thought at a time, which is a great system. Um, but if you're a top down, that's actually going to be really difficult because I don't think in those tiny atomic thoughts all the time. I think in the big. And so it's a really like one of those, oh, yeah, I'm not building a system that's working with me. I'm building a system that has worked really well for others. And so that was a really big, just a ha moment. Um, it also, the quiz also showed you different things like some of your goals, um, which one of the big takeaways I noticed was the desire to showcase this to others and um, wanting to help in others and, and like do things for others was a really big goal. And I had kind of realized that before, but I wasn't doing anything about it. I wasn't <laughs> doing any sort of blog posts or Twitters or anything like that. And so I was realizing like, oh, this makes sense. Like I am looking to go into research. I'm looking at, and like the reason why is because I want to be able to help bridge knowledge to others and things like that. It, um, I should probably get on that, which is part of why I'm here today. And then, so a lot of it was around like a PK should really be your values. So we, the first week is really just all about the survey and building up your values and really going into just like stopping and thinking about it. And I thought that was such a cool way of going about it. That I wasn't expecting coming into the workshop. I really thought it was going to be more like, here is my system, here is my framework, follow A, B, and you'll get C. And I was so surprised and so ecstatic to learn that it really wasn't. Um, so the entire thing is based off of what you might like. Um, so for me, I actually really enjoy the outdoors. I love nature. Um, and I'm in the middle of an urban area in Seattle. I'm on my computer all day as a computer scientist and, um, you know, I don't really see much of it. So for me, I incorporated my values of um, a digital garden, which um, you can see it over on the side just a little bit. And I talk about it in a different video on here, so I won't go into it too much, but basically that I have um, seeds and um, Oh, this is actually a little old. This is my old one, but the idea is still there. So you you take um, different folders and you put them into like a growth mindset. Um, and it just makes me happy every day. And it makes me smile. And I think what I saw from the community was just the excitement of finding something like that and how everyone wanted to find their own version of that. And so you see everything from Nick Milo's one is around ships. And so he loves exploring. So all of his, his whole thing um, is around different explorers, different ideas and explorations. Um, and it's just really fun to see how everybody makes it their own. We kind of already talked about it, but the big thing about it was just not getting hung up on the system. To not jump applications. Um, they were very excited that even though they work in Obsidian a lot and a lot of the um, instructions are for Obsidian, Everyone was so excited to see craft and to see a different um, way of doing things. And, um, but with a strong ask of like, not to just immediately jump systems. Um, I think all of us can get stuck with shiny new object syndrome and it does mess up your flow because uh, you hit those obstacles and then you jump and then you hit the obstacle again in the next one. And so it was really about remembering that this is a journey um, and you're gonna hit obstacles and it's better to work through them and still have all of that work that you did than to start over. And the other big one, just to make sure that your setup doesn't feel like a chore. And if it feels like a chore, then that's the time to do something about it. Because being in your second brain should feel like home, not something that you do because you, you must. Um, another big takeaway was that structure must be earned. Um, this one I think was really impactful for me and one I had seen from his YouTubes early on and was a big inspiration for how I built mine. But to start with everything in just like one folder or as close as possible and then build the structure as you go. To really, does it really need to be in a folder? Does it absolutely, does it get in your way? 
And it's not that folders are bad. Um, you can see on the left here, I have a media folder that I have broken down into many different categories. Um, and that was really important because I, at first I had these all in one area and I started getting really frustrated that I couldn't find them easily. And that's a sign that that structure has been earned. It does deserve to be there and go ahead and make it. But if I had done that right off the bat, I might have made a different type of area. Um, I might not have realized that I actually really needed the oral myths and legends to be on their own um, or different things like that. So by letting the structure be earned, you end up having less thought up front and less frustration later. And then uh, uh, number four, like giving yourself cognitive scaffolding helps your, your brain. So cognitive sca scaffolding is getting things ready to launch. Um, so for example, this is an, a template that would be a cognitive scaffold. It has things that I can easily fill in. And it reminds me to put in my favorite quotes. It asks me what I found interesting about the book. And these are, it's just prompts basically. It's how on earth to help remember. And we really go into that a lot. As you build the framework, you're given a series of prompts um, that I'm not going to share just because they were really a part of the workshop and I don't want to overshadow um, what he's teaching, but a lot of them are on his YouTube for free. So please feel free to go check them out. Um, I would say 90% of them are probably on the YouTube for free, but just in case. Um, but we use prompts a lot and they felt so silly because some of them were really simple. And he was like, no, just go ahead and put it in, just do it. And you know what, it was so helpful. I, it was almost annoyingly helpful. Um, and it was really around using the prompts until the habit forms. And then once the habit forms, you've changed the way you think and you start thinking in that critical analysis of linking things together. And really about how in our society of con consumption, we've kind of turned off the parts of our brain that make those connections automatically and ask those questions in a lot of ways. Not for everybody, but, um, and for varying amounts. But by using these prompts and these scaffoldings, they both relax your brain because you no longer have to think about all the what should I write and you can get into the actual stuff that you want to do. But it also helps bridge that in your brain of starting to learn to ask those questions for yourself again and really adopt that curiosity mindset. And it's been really cool to see over the last two months how much using those prompts where I don't really have to anymore. It's just there. Um, and that was really cool to see. And I would say it makes it me realize that even if they feel silly, it's worth doing. Um, so we talked about it earlier about how uh, Zettles didn't quite work for me. And again, they're great for a lot of people, but for anyone, I was really interested that he went away from the idea of the atomic note, even though he's a big believer in it as well. And so don't be afraid to make the large notes. And I, that was so against what so many people in the PKM community talk about, I was really surprised. But he made a good point that sometimes doing the large notes is really helpful because it allows you to do your stream of thought and, your, and not having to think about, should this be its own thought? Is it connected? Is it not? And just by putting it everywhere. And then you can always go back and trim it or subdivide it if you would like, but sometimes having it all together is really useful. So for example, um, I built out in one of them going through, I have no idea how to pronounce this. I am so sorry, so I'm not going to, uh, but this is a amazing cave system in France where we have some of the oldest examples of human art. And um, I've got all these pictures. It's not super duper long, but I think that the atomic note, I would have tried worried about, should I break this up? Where should the pictures go? Is this whole chat, um, like this isn't even a thought, it's just like a random statement. Um, how, like, I think I would have gotten lost in my thoughts about how to do it. So it was almost like giving the permission to be like, it's okay, you know, messing long notes, don't worry about it. 
And for me, that was really helpful. And probably the biggest impact though that fixed my system was bringing in what he calls maps of contents. And what they are is they're a way to bring in, it's almost like an index. So you use your linking to be able to see all of a different category um, of notes that you have. And what makes it valuable over a folder is you can have links to going to different ones. So, you, and then you can have links that link up the baskets together and different things like that. So it's so flexible. And um, this was covered in like the really last week. And he was like, this is when all of our top down fingers are going to like, it's going to click. And sure enough, it did. And this was the missing piece that before I didn't have. And it, it has made my life just awesome. So for example, we built out this library, which is done using the um, linking your thing classification. All it really does is based off of the other classifications like the Dewey Decimal and the Universal Decimal and things like that. But it changes um, the very first one here instead of, uh, I don't remember what it normally is, but instead of the normal one, it's knowledge management. And it's really just, it's, it's just a map of content. It just, if you, let's say we go to the natural sciences, um, or social sciences, I clicked, I guess. Um, I can update here and I can see all the different things I have under here. We go into my discrimination and bias. I took a class in this um, in my college last semester. And so now I can suddenly see, instead of having all these links that you can see are pretty atomic because that's what I was doing at the time, but now I can start bringing them together. Like I didn't realize I had so many that were just around data. Um, and this, for me, helped bring it all together so I can actually find the thoughts I had had before and then really be able to look at them and make new ones. And so it's just like that discrimination basket, I also have one for horses and for the Victorian era, um, where like the Victorian era, you can see that it's less developed than the other one, um, but I can start adding in different authors, different things like that. The equestrian one, I actually did, um, so how I built, the first one you saw, the discrimination bias, was I took all of the notes that I had already written and put them in. How I built this one out, this was actually one of the example, when we were doing it, this was one of the exercises that we did. And so I just picked a random one. I work with horses, I love horses. And so he's like, get your thoughts from your brain and your knowledge out onto the page. And then we organized it together. And so actually none of, almost none of these were actually notes. And so you can see by hovering over it that most of them are, well, actually some of them have come back in, but most of them were empty. And so what we did was just, I, I just sat here for like 10 minutes and was like, okay, thought about a horse. Um, you know, shires are the largest species. And would make notes and then would um, afterwards would categorize it. Um, and this has been so cool. So this was a fun for me as a top-down thinker. And then also meant that on other days when I feel more like coming in and um, like seeing how, like I really wanna go into a note and really do it. Now I've got oh, a place I can look at and being like, writing is a full body workout. Well, yeah, it definitely is. And I could go into why it is and um, what areas of the body it moves and things like that, which, you know, could end up as a, a blog post somewhere some at some time. Um, yeah, so for me, I think this was the missing piece that really has brought my system together. Um, I now have, looks like 59 baskets, which is, baskets were my decision on it to because of the whole plant fruit analogy I've been going with, but um, yeah. So that I think was probably my favorite area. So that kind of takes away my biggest takeaways. My favorite parts for the Linking Your Thinking workshop was definitely the community. I'm still in touch with a lot of them. I haven't gone back to the alumni quite yet because he actually recommended all of us just taking a little bit of a break because it's a pretty intense workshop. It runs every day for um, just like one session a day for um, four or five weeks. And so, but I know they're there and I can go back to them and chat with them whenever. And I loved the fact that I had a variety of learning styles so that I could show up.
however I was that day. And I can go back and depending on if I want audio or visual or um, reading material, that's all there. And I think that is such a wonderful way to make it accessible to everybody. So I would definitely recommend this workshop if you're interested and um, it's pretty cool. So if anybody would like mm. to go into anything further or if you have any questions. Yeah, we, we've actually, thanks so much, Melly. That was really, really cool uh, to see the, the things you learned uh, during the, the course. Uh, we have one question already and I had a few which I jotted down that. too. Um, Paul mentioned, I, again, I know you said you can't share too much about the specific prompts, but Paul did kind of ask, like, is there a kind of, can you give us an idea of what some of those prompts were like or what kind of categories sure. are just so we can get an understanding of what, what you're talking about? Sure. So one of the ones I know is on his website is um, the ENCODE framework, which you think of it like, um, oh, I don't have the actual questions here. Okay. Well, um, actually... moment when I forgot what the thing was. <laughs> so what's the way? When you've got a live audience, you can never remember <laughs> what you're looking for. Where was the community? That's the one. Okay. Yeah. So this was my notes from the linking you're thinking. Um let's see where would that be? So some of it is like, I think one of our first exercises was I want to make notes because, and so it's like building those tiny little, so there's several different versions of prompts. So there was the types of leading prompts that you see a lot as a writer and things like that, where it helps you kind of jump into it. Then there was the, um, the other type of prompt, which is like the encode framework. Sorry. There we go. Um, which stands for encounter, note, connections, organize, develop, then express. So the idea is an encounter, you encounter everything in your day-to-day -day life just by living. Um, you might learn something, you might see a plane, um, we're encountering each other just by being on this call. If there's something that sticks out to you, then you can make a note of it. And then eventually you'll want to, you know, you want to connect that note to other notes. And then once you have a lot of notes, then organizing them, like you saw in um, the equestrian basket where they were in different areas and I had kind of moved them around or in the library where you kind of put them under different genres. And then um, from there, you that helps you end up developing new thoughts because you suddenly see like, I was saying like, wow, I have a lot of ideas here around data discrimination. How can I think about that in a bigger sense? And by developing that, that'll lead you right into expressing it and sharing it with others, which could look like a Twitter post. It could look like just um, building a new note. It could look like, um, you know, being here on this call today. And that in turn goes right back to the start because you just made something new or encountered somebody and it, it's just a cycle that keeps going. So there's both like the framework kind of prompts and then more of the, um, more kind of like writing prompts um which can look different ways so like the book template um this one is actually would be considered a writing a scaffolding as well um because it makes you think well what is the personal management things i know things like that cool. i don't know if that answers the question the best because i didn't have that quite ready to go but no, hopefully no, that gets it a little bit i think that makes sense paul if you've got any follow-up questions there feel free to ask and am I right in thinking, I remember you in your last presentation, Melly, you shared with us uh, something where it's like, when you come into craft, you have like this thing of like, I want to do this today. And it's kind of got oh, a list of things. That's kind of like yeah. a thing too, isn't it? That's it. It's, it. Even, it's even cooler now because we worked on this <laughs> a lot in um, the linking you're thinking. So it got expanded. So you had seen the, the beginning one. So now, so mine is opening the gate. So he calls it a home note. A lot of people call it a home note page. It's just like, is a spot that if you don't know what you're doing, or you don't know what you're looking for, go there first. Um, and mine's like open the gate because you're coming into the garden. So right off the top, I've got that library that you saw before because um, I really like working in that. And then we worked on um, an I want to area. So actually, yeah, that's a great 
Thank you for reminding me of that. <laughs> so these are all um, prompts as well. And this is all cognitive sca scaffolding. So I can come in here and I can look and see like, well, today I really want to develop a topic. Okay, so it's pointing me in, go look in the baskets in the library, go get a topic. And so even though it doesn't directly link me in some ways, it also like it, it throws you towards it. Um, let's see. This one is mostly like showing you where to go. But yeah. Um, and then I have other things I use. I've got my values, um, different things I might use on cool. occasion. I like that you know, a lot. I like I liked your I want to thing a lot. I haven't applied it to my own thing yet, but I really like that because I sometimes I'm given like an hour of my time. And I'm like, well, how do I use it? And I spend about 20 minutes deciding how to use it. And then the rest of the 40 minutes is kind of wasted. So having something like that, where you kind of come in, it's got some prompts about, oh, these are the things I can kind of do. I think that's really, really cool. So absolutely. Oh, okay. So actually this, this is some of them. Um, so like this was one of the exercises we did and I picked a topic on the screen. I picked reading. So um, one of the prompts was, what does it remind me of? And um, so these were some of the things that came to mind. Then the prompt, the next prompt was, what is it similar or different to? And that's really, um, it's going, this is going right into that connections, questions, and then encounter of like, what can it be both like and both dislike? And then, um, as you're making your note, you can do things like clarifying it, um, trying to really bring in more information or more stuff. Um, the color is kind of silly. It's like making a dramatic bait click title almost um, just to like, what is the one thing that really is important? Um, and then your next one is like critiquing it. Some things of that is what is it like? What is it dislike? And then going into it, you can cite it. And then there's like curating. And so that's all around the seven C's, which is a framework that's all around um, different prompts, which I do not have here apparently not there there we go that's cool um and i believe all of this is on his youtube cool. um so and yeah. obviously the youtube is free and, and stuff like that there's tons of really great stuff there i would say most of the information from the workshop is on the youtube which is previously why i hadn't done it um there was a handful of different things but it mostly, I think that value add is by being able to see it live, getting all the questions live in the community. Cool, makes total sense. We had another question from Tim actually, um, mm -hmm. who asked a somewhat related question. Uh, he said, thanks for, uh, for sharing everything you've shared. Um, he said, if you were to write a blog post based on the things you've learned or linking your thinking in general, do you think you'd write the post on craft or would you prefer to keep content creation uh, separate from ideation? Personally, I do everything in craft because I really, really like the UI. Um, so a lot of times I will go ahead and post it to Medium or, or things like that um, or my personal website. I don't use the um, craft as a website as much as, as some do, even though I think that's a, a great idea. It's just I liked the design I had on the other ones first. Um, but yes, I totally do. So some of it is, I think of what would be a good example here. So sometimes I keep it right in the, my, you might be able to see here to the left, I've got a forest. So a small review seeds are like, um, they're just getting started and they probably have, it's probably just the title or very few things in it. Ferns is like, there's a little bit more information in it, but not very much. And forest is more like, okay, it's more like a, it's more like a legitimate note at this point. Um, so sometimes I do write things and I just keep it in the forest. Other times I use this incubator one um, that allows me to remember that for one, I was the one who wrote it and two, that this is more polished. And then I actually have a writing session down here um, where I keep the ones that I've already written. Um, yeah, so like this is one. Um, so I made a post on um, test-driven development. Um, I put it up on Medium. Um, 
it kind of changed the UI a little or the formatting a bit. So it looks a little weird now, but uh, this was a way to save all of what I wrote. Um, and sometimes I will end up can, like having the links in it. Sometimes I won't, depending on if it's going to be published or not. And yeah, but I do everything in craft. I really enjoy having it all linked together. Um, I don't use the spaces very much other than like I have a space for shared notes between my partner and I in our home. Um, I've got one for medical um, and I mainly only did that after I started sharing everything in here. So there's nothing in here that I wouldn't mind anyone <laughs> seeing on an accident. <laughs> Which was really comforting. There's always the risk when you kind of explore your craft. It's like, oh crap, I didn't need to show that. So I, <laughs> yeah. So I was like, yeah, no, I need to take all the personal things out. <laughs> and it's sometimes really annoying because I'm like, I, I start trying to link it from a note and I'm like, oh, darn it. <laughs> <laughs> But I think it's worth the. Uh, I think the so. <laughs> I, I had another question too, actually. And again, I already um, uh, recommend if anyone's got questions for Melly to throw it in chat or even come on screen in just a second if you want. Um, a question I have was related to a little bit earlier in your presentation. And you mentioned that, you know, a lot of people kind of start with a writing app then switch to a different notes app and switch to a different one. And you mentioned like, you know, with every app you use, you're going to reach a stage where you get frustrated, you get an obstacle of some kind. Do you have any tips about breaking through that kind of shiny object syndrome and just sticking with the, the app you're using? Do you have any tips like around that sort of thing? You know, sometimes you have to go ahead and, and explore it, I think. Um, so I did. I was like in craft for like six months. I hit my blocker. Um, I got really annoyed about the no graph. You all probably saw it on Slack. We constant, please put the graph in. <laughs> um, which I still have. But um, so I made a note on going to Exhibit and um, really explored it. Did the idea of like, if I did it, what would I do? And it's great because I have this all here in case they decided, you know, this isn't going to work out. Um, but as you can see, there, there was there was a lot more thumbs down than <laughs> thumbs up at the end. So I was like, no, fine, I'll stay. <laughs> Deal with my lack of graphs. Not that I wasn't happy to stay. I loved everything about craft minus the graphs, but I was very grumpy about it at that exact moment. Okay, so, so, um, so then I had to find a different way of doing it. And so um, what actually ended up helping a lot was doing this workshop and finding these, um, using these baskets um, as that kind of helped satisfy some of the connection issue I was having that the graphs would have really helped with. Um, so that that helped. Um, I'd still love graphs someday, but um, so yeah. I think sometimes exploring it is good, but really doing a tiny exploration instead of um, going just, just deciding like, oh, everybody's using Obsidian, just go. Um, because everything, it depends on what's right for you and what your use cases are and things like that. But then once you're settled in, I think the cost of moving is really, really high. And so it better be a good reason to do it. Um, and it's likely that there is a way in the area that you're in to help fix that problem. And you might need to look around, you might need to like come around to a different idea or a different thought. In this case for me, it was like going to a workshop to see what it is that I was missing. Because I didn't even know what the obstacle was. I could tell I was getting frustrated, but I couldn't tell why. Um, and so sometimes getting somebody else's thought, whether it's going to these or joining a workshop, but seeing how other people use it can sometimes get the aha moment of, oh, that would help. And I think yeah. that would be, that's one of my biggest I suggestions. That. I love that. And I think that's something, you know, whether it's related to this or pretty much any obstacle in life, so life, I guess, is sometimes it's just that getting to know the obstacle is the most important part. Like actually understanding what am I really frustrated with here? Or what's the real problem here? And sometimes we don't really give ourselves the chance to do that. We just jump ship straight away anyway. Whereas I know for myself, yeah, often just brainstorming or you kind of use the pros and cons list almost with the upticks, uh, the up, um, like thumbs up and thumbs down. So just getting whatever's in your head down on paper or on screen, I think it's really, really useful. It's so helpful because it helps you realize what your values were. And I realized by the end of it that although I really want to graph, my values are for the UI and the easy write and everything like that. And Obsidian, even though I looked at all these different things, did not answer that for me. But it was also great to do because now if I have a friend who is an Obsidian, but they like craft, I can both recommend them to craft. And if they're like, no, craft isn't right, I can also help them get what they want. And to me, that's the most important part is that people are happy with where they're at. Um, but 
with a, a small selfish caveat of being like, come over here, it's cool. <laughs> I like crap. Uh, we had a we had another comment from George. I don't think it's a question. I think it's just a comment. Um, he said that I think giving up on fully adopting someone else's system and crafting your own system works yeah. really well. Uh, and it's very freeing. Um, and he said that uh, allowing and encouraging the system to use to evolve over time with different contexts is also a stress reducer. Um, so yeah, it's absolutely. You know that was such a cool thing, and I was I was really pleased that that Nick actually pointed this out in one of the sessions that not to be because there was someone who got shy because they were just brand new to PKM and so they had like three notes and they were seeing people who had thousands of notes I don't have thousands I have like a couple hundred which is still was a lot and really overwhelming to them and like um I think there can and I think for any of us and for me like I don't have thousands sometimes I look at the people who have thousands of notes and I'm like whoa wow I should follow their system because they're clearly like they've got this down um or you know as a researcher I was definitely intrigued by the Zettelkist and when you look at the productivity that man had as far as getting research papers out I was like oh you know my PhD would go so much faster if I could do that. <laughs> and so you lose that idea though that you're an individual and what works for you doesn't always work for them and um that they didn't get there overnight and I think it is such a human thing to judge ourselves against someone else with only seeing their end case without seeing the years and years and years of struggle it took to get there. So true. And so I think that's such a big one. Oh my goodness, Kitten. Making a chorus for everybody. Um, <laughs> we so definitely sorry, need everybody. to just put this cat on screen for like the click, click bait, right? We just put the cat, put the cat on screen. This could be the, the <laughs> picture and we're done. <laughs> He's the real one giving the talk. Which is a plain point by me, and he likes to, to tell everybody about what they're doing. Oh, there he is. Hello. What's his name? His name is Sherlock. Hey, Sherlock. Sherlock Holmes, because he's very curious. <laughs> he tells us all about it all the time. He's very cute. He can definitely be. I think he heard my partner in the kitchen making coffee, and he's like, somebody's making coffee and doing things. Let's go <laughs> check on them. But, yeah. um, but does he play the cello? <laughs> Hopefully not. not yet. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> Every once in a while, he brushes his tail against it, and it actually makes a pretty nice sound. I'm like, oh, well done, well done, kitten. Oh, and he does hair bow. Who would have thought? <laughs> <laughs> we do have another question from Tim. Actually, uh, Tim asks, uh, "Do you sometimes have bar <laughs> uh, baskets that get unmanageably large? And if so, what do you do to address this issue?" I imagine so. I don't have one quite yet just because I'm still pretty new to them. Um, but I know Nick did for sure. And this one's probably going to very quickly. Um, so <laughs> I started out a film and TV one where I just wrote down everyone I could think about because then I might be able to, and you can see they're kind of in a very loose, I think this one was actually one of our exercises too. Uh, they're in a very, very loose um, sectioning where you can, like Disney's here, Apparently, this is the the English area. <laughs> it's the BBC category, yes. It's the BBC area over there. Um, I like how that's on top. That tells you a lot about, <laughs> about me right there. <laughs> um, I imagine if I kept this going, this would get ridiculous. So one thing I would probably end up doing is, um, well, I can just do it live. I would probably bring this. Um, these that ah, I always forget it does that. Okay, we're gonna go this way into a Disney basket. There we go. And then um, you would have, you know, a film and TV basket that has a basket in it. And because um, sometimes that's needed, like they're going to get kind of big. Um, so that's how I would probably tackle it. Um, sometimes it might be that like you have two different thoughts. I think I have like this one, the discrimination and bias. Those are really tied together, but it could be that um, at some point I would like to separate mm -hmm. those. And then um, you can always just link them together to be like, okay, if you're interested in this, you probably will be interested in that. We talked about this one idea of using a keyword. Um, he calls it the up keyword, but it was really just 
he says it's not really, it was just because Obsidian did a weird thing. So he couldn't start with a note. So, but I kind of like it. Um, so the idea is like where it leads from or where it leads to. So like in here, this one um, doesn't really have an up, but you could also do like a, you know, similar and then put in if we were brought in bias as another basket. So you can really, I think with links, there's such a flexibility on um, how you can point yourself to remember about other things. Awesome. Um, we've got a few questions by Jen. I, I want to be conscious of time. We've probably got about five minutes to go or so. Sounds good. Uh, we've, got, we've got a question, two questions from Jen, kind of related. Uh, she said, uh, where is a good place to begin with craft and linking your thinking? Um, would it be something like personal and work? Like, um, and Jen, feel free to, if you want to expand on the question to let us know. But sure. is there anything, yeah, which you'd, which you'd say yeah, to Yeah, Jen, that feel free that? to jump in if you would like. Um, I do have work in his own category, mainly, again, so if I show this off, there's no accidental chance of showing something I shouldn't. Um, so what you're seeing is all personal in research and things that I know aren't going to cause any problems. Um, so it kind of depends on, on what your goals are. Um, for me, my goals for my, my PKM was really, um, was really around the knowledge I was gaining through reading, through TV, through, um, my research. Um, I was reading enough research articles that I was having trouble remembering which article went to which one. Um, like I would get the concepts, but you know, when you're citing, you've got to be so direct of exactly who and where and when you got that information from. And even with resource managers, it was hard to remember that in my notes. So being able to, to tag it was, I think, one of the starters. I would say when you start, make a folder. Um, it can be anything you want to call it. You know, like for me, it was the garden folder or just in your all documents. And all documents is a perfect way to start. And just make a note. Um, just start. Um, you know, if you need a prompt, just think of like, what was your favorite movie and why? Or what were the last 10 things you, you read? They could be anything, you know, articles, tweets, whatever you want. Um, and then as you're doing that, you'll probably start noticing um, that something kind of goes with each other. And if they do, then that might be a good point to link them together somehow. So um, like here, because it was at the top, I might want to link. Um, I used rock, which is similar. Um, I don't know. It's not going to be this live. <laughs> <laughs> That's a idea. Um, but I would probably, you know, just start with a link. And now suddenly, if I was to look at Obsidian, I could remember about craft. Um, and that could lead me to the idea of like, well, what if I made a document that was like all note taking apps? And that might lead me to putting them down, um, like making one for Obsidian and be like, oh, okay, I already have that one. I already have one for craft. What about logsec? I know I don't have one for that. So I could create it. Now that might bring me to like a, I'm curious what these ones are, which could lead you into getting it. This would lead you all the way down to being able to do a blog, for instance. Cool. That's really cool. Yeah. And what, what, I think one last question, and then I, I think I have to wrap up, but this just brings me onto a question. Like once you started taking these notes, do you have a process for like following up with them and finding these links or do they just kind of happen organically? Is it like you just find it while you're processing them anyway? Do you have any particular system for re-finding these links? Sure. So I do find a lot of them. I love the search feature um, in, in craft because um, whenever I'm making a new note, I try to make sure. So if I'm reading something by Dickens, um, I'll go see what on earth do I also have. Um, and I love the fact that it also brings up the blocks because that's usually where I find the random link that I forgot about. Um, so I have that. I also in the I want to, I think that's a really great way of finding it. Um, where it's like, okay, I actually want to under, like, um, it might tell me 
to go deeper, to go look over here. For me, I ended up bringing in this format. So that way, when I know that I want to go build something more, I should go look in here. If okay. I'm trying to find something, I think the baskets, honestly, for me is where that comes in. Um, Cause if I'm being curious about um, philosophy, I know I've already managed to forget everything that I wrote about it. Cause I don't look at philosophy all that often. And I'm like, oh, wow, I had this thought about this at one point. Good for me. <laughs> Because <laughs> I forget all the time. So I think that's most of my system right now. But as I get more workflows, I'll definitely update you. Brilliant. I mean, so thanks so much, Melly, for taking the time to share this with us uh, and sharing the knowledge you, you've, you've, you've learned in the course. Um, and thanks so much for everyone tuning in as well. Like, um, you know, we do this on a pretty regular basis. And for me, it's just so exciting to share what somebody's built with craft like it's so incredible to see like you know what you've taken craft and kind of built something really really special and interesting with it so thanks so much for that and thanks so much for for educating us all today um and everyone listening in enjoy the rest of your days i see bruce enjoying the sunshine in his garden i so know I I've, been, I've been very jealous <laughs> like wow that's gorgeous <laughs> And um, we'll be back yeah, very soon for uh, for another event. So um, thanks so much. Um, don't forget to check out, if you've got feedback from Ellie, go find her in the in the community, maybe the, the Craft for PKM uh, group for, or something. Um, and yeah, I just hope you've enjoyed your the session today. Um, that's it. And Have I will fun. be posting up that main note along with the ability to follow any of the links from it into the um, post for this event. Brilliant. So. And I'll put it in the YouTube uh, description as well. Perfect. Thank you, Dom. Awesome. Yes, All right. Thank take you care, very everyone. much. Thanks, Mel. See you later, everyone. Bye-bye.